Welcome back, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for an honor to have you. Thank you. Now, and, and, and may I say thank you. It's an honor for me uh, that you would come here and do this today. You know, the, the mayor is a great environmental leader and a great advocate for a good climate, and here it is on a Saturday, and he has a family, and he came out here to be with us. Thank no, you so much. It's my great pleasure. Thank, thank you. Great pleasure. Well, I'm not only here because I believe so deeply in you and the work uh, that confronts us, but I'm usually on the receiving end of questions my entire week, so the thought of actually being able to ask questions and just listen was kind of compelling, too, I got to say. <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, it is amazing to see somebody who has led inside and outside uh, elected politics on the business front, who has been honored globally, and who has always brought here locally to this city um, your incredible work uh, at a moment in which all of us feel a lot of despair. And I think we come here to drink from some hope and from somebody who has stood through good and bad times. But I want to start just with a very simple question that maybe is a Hollywood question. Now, you had a landmark film. I remember being there at the premiere some 10 years ago here in Los Angeles at the Cinerama Dome that seemed to change everything. It was like a spark thrown on the tinder that we were waiting for to be able to move forward. And yet, every filmmaker, producer, when they look at a great success of one film, mm. for every Empire Strikes Back, there's Weekend at Bernie's 2. <laughs> so why a sequel? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I also uh, want to acknowledge the uh, climate leaders who are here from the yes. Climate Reality Project. And I think Where are you they guys sitting? are somewhere. Right back there. There we go. Thank you. So uh, thanks for your kind words about the first movie. Davis Guggenheim uh, here in L.A. Uh, did a terrific job as the director and participant media, also based here, founded by Jeff Skoll. Mm -hmm. uh, they have made uh, so many fantastic uh, documentaries. And uh, Jeff Skoll and I uh, took on board all of the kind uh, comments uh, about Davis uh, Guggenheim's movie. Uh, and, and all so many people have urged uh, us to think about making a sequel for several years now. And when we got to the 10-year anniversary, we, we thought, well, maybe that's a, uh, uh, a time where the audience will give us permission to come back and talk about what's new. And it turns out there are some uh, really important changes that have taken place in the last decade since the first movie. Number one, uh, unfortunately, the climate-related extreme weather events are far more numerous and far worse. Every night on the TV news now is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation, mm. and uh, the <laughs> media doesn't uh, connect the dots often, but people are connecting the dots on their own and realizing that uh, this is uh, an extremely serious threat to the future of our civilization. The second big change in the last decade is that we have the solutions now. Mm -hmm. And a decade ago, they were visible on the horizon, but you had to rely on the technology experts who said, they're coming, just wait, they're coming. Mm -hmm. uh, but now they're here. Uh, and th the fantastic uh, thing is that it, it turns out that solar electricity, wind electricity, batteries, electric mm -hmm. vehicles, uh, and other technologies that are relevant to cutting emissions are following the pattern of computer chips uh, and mobile phones and flat screen TVs. And uh, th it, they yield to research and development. And the cost comes down way faster than anybody mm -hmm. uh, expects. Uh, and then when the production scales up, the, the, the cost down curves uh, get even faster. There was a contract signed uh, two weeks ago uh, in Arizona for unsubsidized electricity from solar at less than half the cost of electricity from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, Chile has signed uh, contracts at the same level, half the cost of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Abu Dhabi, unsubsidized, half the cost. And the, and the cost continues uh, to come down. So bringing the message of hope that we have the ability to solve this now, uh, we thought was uh, really important. 
And also the movie unfolded, uh, the filming of it uh, unfolded at a time <coughs> when at long last the 20-year uh, effort to mm -hmm. secure a global agreement uh, reached a maturity. And at uh, Paris, uh, and thank you, by the way, for coming uh, to sure. Paris during those negotiations. Yep. The, the city yeah, so. uh, played uh, a major role. Mm -hmm. a and um, virtually every nation in the world signed up uh, to net zero global warming pollution mm -hmm. by mid-century, mm -hmm. or as soon thereafter as possible. Uh, and of course, Trump uh, uh, said he was going to pull out, but immediately after that, cities, states, and mm -hmm. I want to give a shout out to your hero governor, Jerry Brown, who uh, signed legislation last week. States and cities uh, and business leaders, a lot of them in California, stepped up to fill the gap and said, we're still in Paris. Yep. And now it looks as if uh, the U.S. is going to meet those commitments re regardless of Trump. So all of these developments mm -hmm. were so new, some of them startlingly new, that we felt as it was a good time to come out and update the message. And people come out of this movie feeling hopeful uh, and yet feeling an increased sense of urgency. And the book of the same title, which, uh, which I see uh, a lot of you have here. Just in case somebody doesn't uh, have it, let me show this to you, because it is available for purchase. <laughs> Um, right here. Oh, I, I love this mayor. Go I out love and, this mayor. and get, and, and there is no limit to how many you can purchase. Ah. It's, it's an amazing <laughs> thing, so thank you, sir. Rodale yeah, Publishing uh, is here. It's, just, and it's only fair. Thank you. Uh, um, and it's a guidebook on how you can be a, a, an effective activist. Well, within this, this book, by the way, um, because I think for so many people there always is that gap. You come out of seeing a movie, uh, a news program, you're either depressed or hopeful, but some extreme emotion. And you always want to know, where do I go? How do yeah, I yeah. make that happen? And so much of this seems like literally a global problem, which it is. And for those of us who are plugged into an international treaty negotiation, or who have a network of mayors, um, who are part of global business associations, we right. know how to do that. But I think the average person lives on a given block yeah. and goes to a given school and works in a given workplace. Um, I know you detail in here many ways that you can start. A great way to start is by being trained. And we're, we, you and I have been talking yeah. about maybe doing something here in LA next year, a mega training or something like that for Angelinos. But where would you tell your average citizen who is yelling at the cable television show yeah, yeah. or curled up in a corner uh, or you know, looking at the Facebook feed and just throwing their hands up, where do you begin to kind of take that hope that you feel after this movie and yeah. put it to use? Well, first of all, learn, learn about it. Knowledge is power. And when you, when you learn more about it, it gives you confidence to speak up and use your voice to win the conversations on climate. I grew up a lot of my childhood in the South, and I saw when the civil rights movement was gaining momentum, people were winning conversations mm -hmm. on the, the immorality of discriminating on the basis of skin color. And that victory preceded the victory in changing mm -hmm. the law. So you, use your voice. Use social media. Uh, if you go see the movie and you like it, get on there and get, get on social media. Go to the website, inconveniencesequel.com. Go on Facebook. Facebook uh, Live is uh, with us right now. Uh, and the other uh, social networks. Uh, and tell your friends and th those uh, you have in, in your uh, contacts uh, that you recommend this, because that's the way word of mouth spreads about this. So um, in addition to using your voice and winning the conversations, use your vote. Uh, you, you, as a citizen, become active and, and let your, let your uh, elected officials know if they're doing the right thing, as your mayor is, Back them up. Let them know uh, that you appreciate that. Others who maybe are not doing the right thing or are just kind of lukewarm about it, give them some more backbone and let them know that you, you want them to share your values and be a part of the solution. And by the way, if they're opponents of action, uh, let them know that uh, unless they change, uh, I mean, I used to be on the receiving end of this, and I know that the two-part message works. If you're with me on this, I'm going to help you. If you're not, I guarantee to you, I'm going to do everything I can to defeat you yeah. in the next uh, yeah. election, and that works. And then use your choices, mm -hmm. including in the marketplace, 
because it's, not, it's non-trivial to insist on the climate-friendly alternatives. It helps you uh, walk the walk, but it also sends a powerful signal to business that they need to pay attention to the consumer demand for climate-friendly uh, alternatives, mm -hmm. and so all those things matter. You know, you, you've talked about um, holding elected uh, officials accountable, and so much of this issue, unfortunately, has been bifurcated by party and by ideology. There's been the few climate deniers have somehow captured most people in one of our two major parties, to, yeah. uh, and certainly our president, um, to try to rewind the clock or ignore the science yeah. and the reality. When you mentioned um, our re recent cap and trade, which wasn't perfect, but it was a brave and important yeah, step yeah, absolutely. forward. And what was interesting here in California is it wasn't just Democrats that voted for it. Right. We had but Republicans. Eight Republican members, some from very conservative right. districts. And, and take another issue, just this past week, a, a tweet which is, doesn't even have, uh, unfortunately or fortunately in this case, legal standing to ban our transgender brothers and sisters from the military where both you and I have served. Um, I saw a lot of Republicans Absolutely. in red places stand up immediately and say, no, anybody should serve. What hope do you have to kind of recapture Republican leadership, elected leadership on this issue? And who are some of those folks that we should be, we might disagree as Democrats, and I hope there's plenty of Republicans here too, on certain issues, but we should be rewarding them on this. And who should we look Absol to? Absolutely. Well, there are some who uh, have been uh, uh, changing on this. Uh, you saw a couple of them uh, on the health care vote as well, yep. Susan Collins and yep. Lisa Murkowski, uh, and, and uh, they were very courageous. <laughs> and in the House of Representatives, there are about uh, 10 Republican senators mm -hmm. who have privately communicated to friends and associates that they would really like to find a way to crawl back out off the end of the long limb they've been sitting on for the carbon polluters, uh, and, and by the way, this carbon, uh, this uh, climate denial didn't happen by accident. Th there's an old saying in Tennessee, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you can be pretty sure it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> um, and, and when you see the U.S. as the only country in the world where the major conservative party is, uh, uh, you, you know, pledged to uh, provable uh, idiocy mm -hmm. on cl climate uh, issues, that didn't happen by itself. Yep. The Koch brothers, Exxon Mobil, uh, they, the LA Times, by the way, won a Pulitzer Prize for yep. telling uh, this story. Um, uh, they have pumped a lot of money, over a billion dollars, mm -hmm. along with some other uh, carbon polluters, into creating uh, false doubts. Mm -hmm. uh, they've created this cottage industry of climate uh, denial. Uh, they took the playbook from the tobacco companies, mm -hmm who years ago responded to the Surgeon General's uh, warning by hiring actors and dressing them up as doctors and putting them on TV and commercials, uh, falsely uh, reassuring people that uh, there, was no, uh, there were no health consequences mm -hmm. for, uh, from smoking cigarettes, and 100 million people died. Um, and the carbon polluters have hired the same PR uh, agents it's all documented, and there's a book called Merchants of Doubt, and mm -hmm. uh, we know what they've done, but they've had an impact. And, and yet, pressure from the grassroots can and often does work. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, LGBTQ mm -hmm. uh, issue, most recently transgender, uh, what, a, what a terrible mistake that mm -hmm. decision was. But I will tell you, if somebody had told me even five years ago, Eric, mm -hmm. that in the year 2017, gay marriage would be fully legal in all 50 states and uh, would be accepted, honored, and celebrated by mm -hmm. two-thirds of the American people, mm -hmm. I, I would have said, well, I sure hope so, but I just think you're being really un unrealistic. It can't happen. Yep. But it did, it did happen. It did. As the late... Uh, <laughs> and... And reflect for a moment on, on why and how that happened. The conversation was one. Mm. When people realized that they had really close friends who were, who were, who were gay or lesbian and they, they were just understanding, oh, 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 I get it now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if God created people to fall in love with uh, 
uh, one sex is a, compared to the other. God couldn't have intended them to be persecuted for the rest of their life, so come on. And young people said, what's the big deal here? Come, mm -hmm. come on. Uh, and so we, we, we changed. Mm -hmm. And every great social movement, from civil rights and abolition before that, women's suffrage and women's rights and uh, anti-apartheid, the late Nelson Mandela said it's always impossible until it's done. Right. Uh, and all of them have seemed like they were impossible uh, because the resistance was ferocious and they mm -hmm. seemed complicated. But when the straw men were disposed of and the underbrush was cleared away and the central choice was revealed as between what's right and what's wrong, then the change came mm -hmm. quickly. We're right at that point on climate. Now is the time for shoulders to, to the wheel. Uh, and I'm hoping that this movie and this book will contribute to that momentum, but it really has to come uh, from the, the grassroots, and that, that's really why we're doing this. Well, y you have provided us with great strategy over the years. In military terms, you have your strategy, and then operationally, you have operationalized this movement. You truly have through the films, uh, through the folks that you're training. But I want to get down to the tactical level. Now. Okay. When you're out there with folks, you know, a, a lot of people read, it was the most read article, I think, in the New York Magazine's history, David Wallace Wells' uh, The Uninhabitable Earth. Folks read that uh, piece mm. in here. Had some kind of pushback that it was too, yeah. you know, bleak. the sky is falling too bleak. Um, I was, yesterday, I was telling you across the way here at Bergamont Station, there's a great, uh, the Fetterman Gallery, there's uh, the photographs of Sebastião Salgado, who mm. you may know the black and white photographs from the mines in Brazil, but he has been chronicling the 44% of Earth that's still wild. We've yeah. lost 56% of it. Yeah. That's kind of something that makes you feel good and motivated about the Earth. I was with Governor Schwarzenegger recently, and we were both talking about this, that it seems like people enter this issue from such radically different places. Yeah. Some because they love the Earth. Some because they're worried that things are going right. uh, to be destroyed. Some from economic development, T. Boone Pickens, going out there making money on wind. Um, others because of national security. Right. Our, our admirals who say, no, we're not going to stop studying this and thinking about this in the Pentagon because we need to put our aircraft carriers in right. ports that will disappear. What do you find in that kind of Swiss Army knife of blades and screwdrivers and everything else <laughs> to be the most effective? Should we be all carrying around the entire thing? Or do you come down to one or two that really is the most effective across the board with different people who think differently? Well, for, first of all, uh, it's always good advice to, to remember uh, the maxim, uh, first seek to understand. Uh, if you're in a conversation with someone on this and they're, they're not on side and they have really genuine reservations, uh, first seek to understand uh, what form of climate <laughs> denial they're, 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 they're locked into and, the, and then uh, mm -hmm. address that. But I have found that uh, among the issues you raised, the issue of jobs is a particularly powerful one. Mm -hmm. uh, solar jobs are now growing, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, mm -hmm. 17 times faster than other jobs in the economy. Mm -hmm. The single fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Mm -hmm. uh, you've advocated retrofill, uh, yep. retrofitting buildings. That's a source of tens of millions of jobs if, if, yep. if we get on with it. So, you know, we have this uh, economic situation where middle income wages have stagnated and the overall global economy has kind of low growth and it's not really mm -hmm. strong enough yet to, to lift people's prospects. We need a big global project that puts lots and lots of people to work mm -hmm. doing things that will make the future better. Well, we have such a, a project mm -hmm. and we have the technologies now that, that we can install. The world is in the early stages of what many are calling the sustainability revolution, mm -hmm. which has the scope and scale of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital mm -hmm. revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's empowered by the new digital tools and the internet of things. We know now how to manage uh, molecules and atoms the way the information industry learned how to manage bits of information. Mm -hmm. And it's changing uh, everything quickly. Uh, India just uh, announced that in only 13 years, 100% of their new cars and trucks are going to have to be electric vehicles. That's an amazing uh, commitment by a developing country. But 
but they're seeing the employment potential, they're seeing the chance to clean up their air because the co-pollutants from fossil fuels, as every Angelino knows, uh, creates other problems. And in the developing countries, they are really dealing with uh, tremendous air pollution issues with urbanization and continued population growth faster in vehicles than in people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find that the economic argument with many people is the one that works. Increasingly, the national security mm -hmm. argument is also powerful. This movie tells the story of what happened in, in Syria, mm -hmm. and of course there are multiple causes of the Syrian civil war, but well before that civil war started, there was a climate-related unprecedented drought, mm -hmm. by far the worst in 900 years of record keeping there, um, that destroyed 60% of the farms in mm -hmm. Syria killed 80% of their livestock, yep. uh, drove one and a half million refugees into the cities where they collided with a like number from the Iraq mm -hmm. war, and WikiLeaks uh, released information uh, about conversations among the Syrian ministers, again, long before the Civil War, saying, this is gonna explode on us, we can't deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the Civil War started and the gates of hell opened tragically. And the outflow of refugees from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East, and North Africa uh, has begun to destabilize some countries in, in, in Europe now. Uh, the, the, one of the most persuasive ads in the Brexit campaign in mm -hmm. the UK was this big billboard showing long lines of refugees at the borders of Europe, or refugees from, you can tell, from the mm -hmm. Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and, and so that's the reason the Pentagon for years has been saying this is a national security threat. We have to deal with it. And it's, it, it's unacceptable any longer for our country, the greatest country in the world, where the people have the ability to drive policy to allow our government to be captured and twisted and distorted and manipulated by a few very wealthy carbon polluters who bend the politicians to their will. We've got to take back control of our government. Absolutely. So were you surprised by the president's withdrawal from Paris? You know, uh, I, may, I may have been one of the few that actually was surprised by it. Because you sat down with him I and, did. and I, talked with him. And I know, look, I, I'm an elected life and we keep conversations private, but what, what did you leave that then thinking was possible? Yeah, and that wasn't the only conversation. I went to Trump Tower after the election and before the inauguration, but I continued mm -hmm. the, the conversations after he was in the White House. And as you uh, noted, I've respected the privacy of those conversations, but I had reason to, to hope that there, there was a, a good chance that he would come to his senses and stay in the, the, the Paris a, agreement. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was wrong <laughs> about that. And I think that you know, he surrounded himself with this rogues gallery of mm -hmm. uh, uh, climate deniers uh, who have these close ties with the same carbon polluters that I was referring to earlier, and I think they just uh, outshouted the uh, members of his inner circle who wanted him to stay in the Paris Agreement. And, and after he did that, mm -hmm. I was really concerned right away. I, I made mention of this earlier, but I was so gratified when you and all the other yeah. leaders uh, here in the U.S. came out and when the other countries uh, doubled down. It was as if the rest of the world uh, was saying, we'll show you, Donald Trump. Yeah. We're going to meet this agreement uh, commitments even even faster. Well, I, I agree, and I don't ever want to be Pollyannish about this because of the work that we have, but we were sharing backstage um, that we had a group called Climate Mayors, which I chair here in the United States, that started with three cities, went to 30 cities before the Paris Accord to try to give the Obama administration some wind uh, behind its sails. Uh, after Donald Trump was elected, we doubled our membership to about 60. And when he withdrew from Paris, we, uh, to date, now have 362 cities that say, if you opt out, we're opting in. And right. I'll, I'll share this with you because there is such hunger for American leadership still globally. I was at our, our sister city, uh, Berlin, for our 50th anniversary just earlier this month. And the mayor of Berlin and I were at a, a big annual party he does there. And I got up on the stage and I said, 
the same thing I just told you, I said that's in 44 American states and it represents the entire population of Germany. Mm. And they went wild. So we know that we can organize where we live, where we work, where we pray, where we study, those places still. And I, I guess the question I'd ask is, do you think he's um, given us even more motivation to go further than we might have gone had he stayed in, but perhaps not been very aggressive at meeting those goals? Well, it's an inter interesting question, Eric. Uh, I wish he had stayed in. I, I, we need leadership yep. from America's uh, president. Uh, the world needs America's leadership. Um, but there's a law of physics that sometimes operates in politics. Mm -hmm. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the upsurge of activism on climate and other progressive uh, issues has been fueled in part by the reaction to what Trump is doing and saying and tweeting and all the rest. Um, and um, w by the way, we're partnering, uh, the Climate Reality Project um, and is partnering with the Indivisible Movement on the launch of this movie. And you may have seen, some of you may have participated in some of these uh, town hall meetings that the uh, uh, Republican opponents of climate action and health care reform uh, have been having. And wow, what a difference that uh, mm -hmm. has made. Um, one of my trainings, I'll tell this quick story, was in mm -hmm. Denver a few months ago. And one of the uh, participants was, was somebody uh, trained in Denver. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, one of the uh, trainees, I, I was worried she was too young. Uh, mm -hmm. She's only 11 years old. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I've sometimes thought we ought to have one of those bars like they have at the amusement park <laughs> where you have, you, know, you have to be taller than this bar. But um, she was there taking notes and did the whole three days. And two weeks later, I saw, I clicked on this video on uh, social media, and there she was in Colorado Springs at a town hall meeting of her Republican congressman just giving him hell about <laughs> climate. And I went, yeah. And, yeah. and the video went viral, and she ended up by an, very politely inviting him to come to her science class the following week where she was going to give the entire slideshow herself. <laughs> he, was busy, he was busy that day. <laughs> but, I yeah. but I guarantee you, when enough people knock on the district office doors uh, and, uh, where, and go to these meetings and show up physically, I mean, clicking a box on the internet is, is good, but you got to be physically present and meet with others and uh, use the strength in numbers. When enough people do that, we are going to win this. We are going to win this. The, the only question is whether we win it in time. How fast mm -hmm. can we win it? And I, I think we're right at the tipping point now. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you one thing before we show a, a clip from the movie. Um, when you looked at the Uninhabitable Earth article, um, my professor from my days under, as an undergraduate, I, I, yeah. I thought that the science requirement was too tough and someone said, take design and maintenance of a habitable planet with Wallace Broker. And this uh -oh. was in the, the yeah. late 80s when I was an undergraduate. Oh, great. Yeah, he's a real um, giant. He was one of the first per people to start. He's uh, given some credit for uh, coming up with the term global warming, uh, who now thinks we're going to have to do things to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Right. Right. Uh, there's things that we can do in our power generation. There's work on our buildings and our transportation network. If you were a portfolio manager looking yeah. to solve this problem, what percentage would you invest in these different solutions today? How much would you put behind power? How much would you actually look at the technology moonshots to pull carbon out? In, or, in other words, you know, we're going to win, but how do you, you know, allocate your resources for all of us who are looking to, look, to put our time and our money and our attention to these different strategies? Well, you know, sustainable uh, uh, investing is growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. You'll hear about uh, impact investing, but sustainable investing, which is aimed at being a part of the solution, but also giving uh, uh, investors a, 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 a great return, that is a very fast-growing area of the investment uh, marketplace. Uh, and uh, overall, it, it is really having a very positive impact. 
Uh, and the, the question you ask really requires a more of a fine-grained answer than I'd, I'd be comfortable sure. going into in detail here. But if you look at where you can make the most difference, mm -hmm. you know, about 40-some-odd uh, percent mm -hmm. of the global warming pollution is coming from the electricity generation factor mm -hmm. uh, sector. A and so speeding up the development and deployment of wind and solar is, is really incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Batteries, a lot of investors are looking at the new battery technology, mm -hmm. solid state lithium ion, altogether new battery chemistries. We were talking backstage yeah. and I was sharing my what I'm learning from others that uh, we're very close to seeing some r revolutionary mm -hmm. breakthroughs in battery technology. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's important is that the renewable sources are uh, intermittent, and everybody knows that means the sun doesn't shine at night, and the wind often doesn't blow during the day as strongly as it does at night. And when, when you can store that electricity mm -hmm. for, you know, even six or eight hours, mm -hmm. then that's a complete game changer. And in fact, last year in the U.S., if you look at all of the new electricity generation that was built, mm -hmm. almost 75 percent of it came from solar and wind, yeah. virtually none of it from coal. Uh, now we're seeing that same pattern develop in a, in a lot of other countries. So uh, uh, power generation and batteries are two of the things that I would uh, uh, yeah. focus on. But there are hundreds of technologies that fall under the label of efficiency, mm -hmm. and they don't have the sex appeal, they, mm -hmm. they don't have the high profile, uh, but um, taken together, that's one of the biggest solutions. Yep. I'll mention just one more. Uh, I was going uh, with the directors of this uh, movie, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenck, uh, into a, an event uh, last night over at the Landmark Theater. And just before we went in, we got the tweet that uh, Tesla was introducing, and did introduce last night, their new mm -hmm. consumer model of electric car. $35,000 puts it in the range of a lot mm -hmm. more people, because what they're selling now is you know twice that mm -hmm. price. And, and Every automobile manufacturer in the world mm -hmm. is now racing to introduce electric yep. vehicles. And since uh, LA and California get the majority of its emissions mm -hmm. from uh, transportation, that's a sector that okay. is really important also. Well, because these are all teachable moments locally too, we invite you to get involved in that here in LA. We uh, have something called PLAN, which, which the L and the A are capitalized for yeah. LA, but it's our yeah, yeah. kind of agenda. One of the things we said is within five years we'd make half of our electric, our, our vehicle purchases for our city of LA fleet electric. We did that in a year. Wow. In fact, all That's the cop great. cars that aren't uh, police great. cruisers, um, all of our non-cruisers for the police department, it, one year turned into I3s, the BMW won the bid, um, and we saved 40% of the cost on maintenance the first year. So Fantastic. it was great for our bottom line. Second is with our Department of Water and Power, the largest municipal utility will be off of coal by 2025, but now we're moving towards getting off of carbon and 100% renewable. Those conversations we will have with the community and with stakeholders about how we can do that and how quickly, including the conversation you and I had. So we invite you to be a part of that. And third, um, speaking of drought and of water, we had a very wet year this year, but before that we had the, the deepest drought in recorded history yep. here in LA. And one of the big drivers of electric uh, Use, electricity use is bringing all that water to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And so our goal is instead of 85% of our water coming from outside of LA within the next 25 years, make 50% of that come from here through reuse and through recycling and water. So That's great. it's another place that we can all come and get together. We have a, a bunch of great questions, but I want to roll a clip, whoever is up there in, in heaven. If you can roll uh, the inspiring clip, please. This movement is in the tradition of every great moral movement that has advanced the cause of humankind. And every single one of them has met with resistance to the point where many of the advocates wondered, how long is this gonna take? Martin Luther King famously, when someone asked, how long is this gonna take? He said, how long, not long, because no lie can live forever. How long, not long because the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We are close in this movement to the tipping point 
beyond which this movement, like the abolition movement, like the women's suffrage movement, like the civil rights movement, like the anti-apartheid movement, like the movement for gay rights, is resolved into a choice between right and wrong. And because of who we are as human beings, the outcome is foreordained. And it is right to save the future for humanity. It is wrong to pollute this earth and destroy the climate balance. It is right to give hope to the future generation. It will not be easy. And we too will encounter a series of no's. But after the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. I got to say that the, the 20 foot Al Gore is very impressive. The six, the six foot one is right here and we have some audience questions for him too. So I, I have six questions from the audience. I'm going to try to get to all of them in our remaining time. Uh, environmental activist Carol Kravitz writes that she feels paralyzed. So this is yeah. more of a self-help question. Yeah. How do you combat the constant two steps forward and three yeah. steps back? How do you cope? Please help me cope, she writes. Yeah, well, that's a great uh, qu question. Uh, and despair can be paralyzing, no, no question about it. And one of the, any, any of us who work uh, on the climate issue have a, an internal dialogue at times between hope and despair. I've been at this 40 years, and mm. uh, that lets me put the current situation in perspective. Mm -hmm. And throughout all that time, we've continued to to make progress. Um, and again, as that clip emphasized, uh, there are precedents uh, because all of these previous great movements uh, gave plenty of reason for advocates to be vulnerable to feelings mm -hmm. of despair. But there is hope in action. Uh, there's an old African proverb, uh, when you pray, move your feet. Mm -hmm. uh, wh when, when you start to, to feel any sense of despair, then, you know, get involved, do something. And again, not, don't just uh, uh, check a box on the internet. That's, again, that, that helps. But go to these meetups, uh, uh, join the Climate Reality Project, get involved with Indivisible, go with the Sierra Club, go with some of these other groups that are doing such great work on the ground, back your mayor and others who, who are really looking for support to move faster. And when you get active, mm -hmm. uh, that, that itself is an antidote. But on an intellectual basis, look at the facts. We, are, we now ha can solve this. We are making progress, no question a, a, about it. Uh, so it's a personal um, choice, but for me, Hope is not just an act of will or, you know, uh, I, I hope so. It really is an objective analysis of what I've seen develop, especially during the last 10 years. All right, Carol, you feeling better? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> so I think we've addressed, but I want to say it, the sixth grade teacher named Nick writes that, honestly, is climate change past the point of no return? If not, what needs to happen? I think you've been talking about what needs to happen, but do you still have days where you think we're past the point of no return? Uh, no, I don't. I, I've, I've spent enough time with the leading scientists to feel very confident that we still do have enough time mm -hmm. to avoid the, the worst and most catastrophic consequences of the climate crisis. But I have to a add that in, in all uh, candor and honesty, um, we should have acted earlier, and there have been some uh, points that we shouldn't have crossed that we did, and regrettably, some damage has been locked in that we're going to have to deal with. For example, one of the scientists in this movie is a guy named Eric Rigno, who uh, is often here in, in uh, L.A. And he was the lead author of a, a very impactful study printed a couple of years ago showing that one of the biggest sections of uh, West Antarctica has, in fact, passed a tipping point beyond which it, you know, it can't be saved now, and that will lock in a certain amount of mm -hmm. sea level rise. But Eric and his colleagues point out, okay, look, because uh, I'm asking him what Carol's asking me right, right. when this study comes out, mm -hmm. and he says, hold on now, look, we can still have an impact on how fast this happens, and 
More importantly, we can still have an impact on whether the other ice sheets behind this one uh, will, will go a as well. Uh, let me give you a couple of geeky uh, numbers based on the math. Good, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Um, we're putting 110 million tons of this man-made global warming pollution up there every day. Some of it will still be there for thousands of years. Mm. But if you ask the following question, if we somehow uh, were able to magically stop all man-made uh, contributions to this tomorrow, how long would it take for 50% of it to fall out of the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. The answer, astonishingly, is about 20 years. Yeah. Now, we can't magically turn it all off uh, tomorrow, but there, there, are, there are healing mechanisms that can work to it's our like smoker's advantage. lungs. If you actually stop smoking in your life, you can actually... Yeah, and it, it's the yeah. same kind of thing where the doctors will say, well, regrettably, you've affected yeah. your risk factors, right. but if you stop yep. smoking cigarettes now, then the numbers improve. Mm dramatically mm -hmm. year, year by year. So it's the same, it's the same kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lane Semper wrote a little bit about um, food, which we didn't talk about in this, yeah. and I think you have some in the movie. What can we do about a more plant-based diet, um, about what we see in, you know, it's the middle class gets cars and the middle class eats meat yeah. globally. Uh, what can we do as population continues to grow to address some of the inputs from that end? Yeah, this is a sensitive issue because uh, choices about diet are very personal and I never proselytize mm -hmm. on that. There are people who say, you should, you should. Um, you know, I've been a vegan for five years mm -hmm. my, myself and I, I did it for, but I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't say that uh, in order to kind yeah. of project, you must become a, you know, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. But I'll tell you what the doctors are, are saying. Uh, you, your cardiologist will tell you that the less red meat you eat, the healthier you will be, and the, the lower your risk factors uh, for mortality and morbidity will, 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 will come down. Uh, so it, it's a good, healthy mm -hmm. choice. Um, and agriculture, particularly animal agriculture, is a non-trivial cause of the crisis in the first place, about 15%. There's some who say it's much higher than that. It's about 15% according to the scientists, which is a huge number, mm -hmm. and it drives a lot of deforestation also. Uh, but yes, it, it is good for uh, our bodies mm -hmm. and good for the planet to reduce uh, mm -hmm. the consumption of meat, particularly red meat, and to adopt a, mm -hmm. a plant-based, uh, an increasing, uh, increasingly plant-based uh, diet. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa Bachter writes here, is there any legal means or mechanism by which Congress can override Trump and reinstate the U.S. <laughs> in the Paris Climate Accord? Uh, no, but, <laughs> but if you want to get into the weeds on this, here's a fun fact. The way the, the Paris Agreement was written, not entirely coincidentally, by the way, the first date upon which Trump's decision could actually be implemented after the mandatory waiting period and notification period and blah, 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 happens to be the day after the next presidential election in November of 2020. Interesting. And and if there is then a, a new president, uh, uh, if not before, uh, <laughs> well, we're only six months into this experiment. Uh -huh. Feels like a decade. <laughs> but but uh, a new president can get back into the agreement mm -hmm. after giving only 30 days notice. So if you and your fellow mayors and Governor yep. Brown and his fellow governors and Apple and Google and other businesses, large, small, and medium size, uh, keep the momentum going, uh, then ultimately this could be just a speed bump. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Trump has isolated him, himself mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Uh, and 
as the movie says, if Donald Trump refuses to leave, the American people will. Well, you gave, uh, <laughs> you, you gave a great segue to the next one, um, talking about the next presidential election, which I'm sure you never hear, but would you consider running for president on the environmental platform, maybe even the Green Party? <laughs> It's right here, I swear. Somebody actually did write it, though. So. Yeah. Well, I am a recovering politician. <laughs> and as I say in the movie, the longer I go without a relapse, the less likely one becomes. <laughs> um, our final audience question is, uh, and we've had recent experience uh, with this out at a place called Aliso Canyon. Um, what is your yeah. opinion of methane or natural gas these days? Yeah. Um, so-called natural gas is, you know, 99% uh, methane, and methane is the second largest contributor after CO2 to the climate crisis. And again, some geeky numbers. Um, over a 20-year period, the uh, global warming uh, forcing or potential of a, a molecule of methane is 80 times, 82 times larger than a molecule of CO2 and you extend uh, out over longer periods of time, it, it, it comes down to, I don't know, uh, 60 times, uh, 40 times. The, the math is above my pay grade there. <laughs> sure. But it's bad. It's yep. really bad. And what that means is, among other things, that leaks of methane completely eliminate any advantage that methane has over coal or, or, or oil. Now, if there are no leaks, then uh, you can get the same energy from gas as from coal and have only half of the CO2. And some people say, well, that means the glass is half full and not half empty. But, the, but it's poured into an atmosphere that's already completely full. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, question very seriously the commitment that so many have been making mm -hmm. to natural gas. Right now, there is a frenzy of construction and planning to build massive new natural gas pipeline networks, uh, mainly from the Appalachian region yep. in all directions. And if they are all built, then the danger is that locks in the country to a, a, a long-term uh, em emission budget for CO2 that would make it very difficult for, for the U.S. to meet its part of the solution here, and, and so I, I'm very much uh, opposed to it. Uh, there have been times when many of us have looked at the 50% figure and said, well, that can be a bridge uh, mm -hmm. until we get to renewables. But now that renewables are here, uh, there's really no further excuse for it, in, in my opinion. Uh, and by the way, uh, Eric, there have been several uh, bake-offs or competitions yep. for, but, uh, with utilities mm -hmm. that are looking at uh, what, what they should do for the new increment of electricity they need. Bake-offs between natural gas and solar. Mm -hmm. There was one recently in Minnesota on the Canadian border, recently one in uh, Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, and, in, and in most cases, the price uh, for electricity from solar is significantly below the electricity from, from gas. So now that the economics work for us, mm -hmm. uh, and this movie tells the story of uh, Georgetown, Texas, mm -hmm. um, described as the reddest city in the reddest county in Texas. And the mayor is a conservative Republican Trump supporter. He happens to also be a CPA, mm -hmm. and he ran the numbers. And Georgetown, Texas has just become the largest city in the U.S. to already be 100% uh, on renewable electricity in the heart of oil and gas yep. country. So the, the, uh, just as the uh, carbon polluting companies finance this uh, uh, climate denial, mm -hmm. they are also now financing an, a strange new form of denial, as it's been called, to try to hold back solar, hold back yep wind and, yep. and other renewables. But when the price differential gets where it is, even in the heart of oil country, yep. they're saying, hey, you know, this is more jobs, cleaner air, mm -hmm. lower electricity bills, mm -hmm. 
And as a side benefit, we save the future of human civilization. Pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Well, one last LA brag is we just opened about a month ago the largest, most powerful rooftop uh, solar installation in the great. world wow, down by the great. port of Los Angeles, five warehouses. It reflects not only from the sun down, but from the roof up, which is white, wow. and it's two-sided uh, solar technology. Good for you, um, that's fantastic. And that's something all of you now own right here in LA. That's great. But I, I see Ted over there. Let me, let me just conclude. Uh, on behalf of a grateful city, to have your presence. You know, I'm, I, I joked when I spoke at the Democratic Convention last year that I was your average uh, Mexican-American Jewish-Italian. <laughs> and so many people don't know I'm Jewish, but I was studying with my rabbi about uh, three months ago. And uh, she said, you know, traditionally in the Talmud, there's been two types of characters in the Bible. There's been the prophet and there's been the pastor. The prophet tells us what's coming and what we must do to prepare for something. The pastor is the person who is there actually doing the organizing, the person who helps us in difficult moments. What do I do when I'm feeling no hope? Uh, I've gone through a tragedy. I face a challenge. And it's rare to find both of them in a single person. But I think in Al Gore, we have a prophet and a pastor. Mm. Somebody who has... Uh, hold on. Well, but before, before you continue this, I just have to say, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and I've got this prototype battery-powered hubris alarm, <laughs> and, it, and it's, it's on vibrate, and it's going crazy right now. So, so that's the proper response, but I also was told once, just be comfortable in the light for a moment, because we need that light. And you are a humble person, and you have chipped away at this for a long time when the audiences were two or three people and not hundreds. But thank you for what you have done. And if I can make a promise on behalf of my city, is that we will take that mantle and run with it from you. That we will go and be organizers in our communities, in our cities, in our world. And I know the folks that are younger than you and younger than me that are in this room and that 11-year-old are going to be the ones who are just as important leaders. But we are so blessed. And thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Albert. Thank you so much.